Hello, everybody. This is Chapter 2, Angels in Disguise. And the book is The Dragon Scourge by M. R. R. Lopez. She rode in a cart pulled by a mule. The woman was old, and her hair was the color of snow, but her weathered face was warm and kindly. When Nobethus saw the youth crumpled in a bloodied heap in the middle of their path, her heart was full of compassion. Unable to lift his heavy body on her, her own, Nobetha fixed a stretcher to pull him behind the cart so that she could take him back to her small house deep in the side of the forest where she could clean his wounds and wait and hope for the best. Many hours later, the closed, cloudy gray eyes fluttered open. He winced as he felt a wet cloth press against his injured shoulder. Then he heard an old woman's voice say, Be still, boy. The clove blinked and tried to open his mouth to speak, but only painful gurgles came from his throat. Drink this, she instructed. It will help some. The clove felt a smooth porcelain cup slide into his fingers, but as soon as his rough hands gripped it, the fragile cup was crushed to pieces. His gray eyes widened with worry and regret. Porcelain was expensive, at least where he was from. His mother had, had a set, but she never used it. The clove now knew why. Nabetha frowned. Hands made for war never prosper, dear heart. Be gentle, she encouraged, as she poured him some more tea, inside a mug this time. The clove nervously clasped the mug and downed the hot tea in a single gulp. When he had finished, Nabetha took the mug from the young brute and replaced it with a wooden bowl filled with warm stew. There, now, eat it slowly, she instructed him, grimacing as she watched the barbarian struggle to choke down the vegetable stew. It was very much like watching a dog trying to eat broccoli. The broth was bitter, and Leclo choked down the strange herbs and roots the best he could, but there was something missing in the stew. Surely something was wrong with it, but he wasn't about to complain. Not that he could. Was this woman trying to feed him elf food? Where was he? Of course, he wouldn't say this out loud, for the elderly woman might not have been able to afford it, he thought, until he heard the tinkling bells and bleeding goats from coming up from outside. As if hearing his inner thoughts, Nabetha explained, The goats give milk and cheese. I have never lifted my hand to spill the blood of any creature, she explained. She explained in such a way that, while he was under her care, that she expected him to abide by her rules. Leclo wasn't entirely sure how to respond to this. Nobetha was too old. She sounded too old to be an elf. Elves were allergic to meat. At least, that's what he was told, anyway. But he never actually heard of anyone not eating meat out of choice or preference. Nubetha smiled as she saw the perplexed look that come over the young man's face. All life is precious. McClove offered a polite smile as his mind began to drift. He wondered what he would do now. He was blind and mute, but surely there was a way to break the curse. Somehow. Nubetha placed her hand on McClove's head noting his distressed expression, and said, Rest. The curse is strong, and you can do nothing right now. Rest, my dear. You'll need it. The closed, sightless eyes grew heavy, and for a moment he felt at peace. Sleep came quickly, and it seemed that he woke only moments later, he could smell the cool evening breeze wafting across his face from the window 
nearby. When he heard his name be called, Le Clove, be still, he heard the old woman say, All is well. At the sound of his name, Le Clove was everything but still. In seconds he was out of the cot, standing with his shoulders to the wall. How did she know his name? Who was she? What did she want? Nubetha did her best to assure her guest that he was all right. Forgive me. I wish I could do more for you, but I am not strong enough to break the curse without bringing it upon myself. Nubetha began, trying to calm her guest down, but Le Clove remained tensed and poised to lash out. Le Clove, be still. You have nothing to fear, she assured him. Le Clove had enough dealings with magic. He was truly terrified and shuddered at the sound of his own name, being called up by the strange old woman. Who was she? Where was he? Yes, I know your name. And the ancients tell me many things. I also know the name of the serpent that you killed, she explained. The clove swallowed hard and shifted nervously. He didn't understand, but Nobetha did not expect him to. The ancients were the ones who remembered. They conversed amongst themselves in tongues that few took time to listen to, and just a handful understood without going utterly mad. My name is Nobetha, she continued. You slept for four days. I wasn't sure if you would live, and I wished to know what to write above your grave. But your kind do not bury the dead, do they? The clove felt as if his throat had gone bone dry. He swallowed again. It was true. They never bury the dead. How could she know so much about him and his kind? Alas, he reluctantly nodded in confirmation. For he couldn't speak, which was unfortunate because he had so many questions. Chapter 3 A Hidden Blade Nubatha sighed. You must be starving. I have a pot of broth on the stove heating up. He was starving. And indeed, he could smell the, the savory broth simmering in the cauldron. Or the pot. He hadn't seen either one, but whatever it was, it seemed to be always full of something squishy. Soup, broth, stew. Things that were easy to chew. Still blind, Le Clove was forced to use his remaining senses in order to navigate through the world of darkness. With the promise of food, Le Clove's fear soon gave way to curiosity, and he ventured forward, feeling his way along the wall until he felt the pile of potatoes on the countertop. Nobetha smirked as she watched the young barbarian, despite being blind, find the food in a matter of seconds. Instinctively, Le Clove took a raw potato in his hand and was about to put it into his mouth when he heard the woman speak up again. Dear me, I hope I have enough potatoes for the soup, she mused out loud. Le Clove froze. The crisp potato crunched slowly into his mouth before he swallowed, and he guiltily put the half-eaten potato back down on the cutting board. His hand nudged the wooden handle of a knife. Not wishing to appear any more rude than he had already been to his host, he took up the knife and began cutting up the potatoes for the soup. If there was one thing he knew, it was how to use a knife. Being blind made no difference to him. Nobetha grimaced when she saw how nimble his hands were with the knife. The ancients had told her that this boy's hands were trained for war. But not just any war. Like a single spark of flame, he would take on the eternal night. Nubatha closed her eyes and sighed. 
She knew you would never win. No, not like this. She had lived a long time and knew better to let things like this slip from her mouth. What was to come would come. Neither he nor she could stop what was to come. That was how men went mad. While it was prudent to listen, it was wise not to listen too carefully. Some things were better to left to the ancients. Alas, she already knew too much. Suddenly, Leclo let out a yelp. Nobetha's blue eyes snapped open, and she put a frail hand to her mouth, thinking he must have cut himself. Leclove merely grunted and shook his hand up about, for he had gotten too close to the fire and had burnt himself. Nobatha rushed over to examine his blistered fingers and breathed out a sigh of relief. Thank heaven! I thought you cut off your hand! She pressed some cool green parsley onto the burn. Sit down, sit down, she exclaimed. The clove wasn't exactly sure how, what to make of all this, but the crazy old woman pulled him over to the table, adding, I'll not be having my guests hurting themselves in my kitchen. She fussed. When Nobetha looked back, she sighed when she saw him nibbling at the parsley and shook her head. Leave it be, the soup will be finished soon, she scolded him. The clove put his hands back down on the table all the time wondering if he had seen him take the knife. If she had, she didn't say anything. The thought made him feel slightly guilty, but he wasn't exactly stealing it. He was going to give it back. Just not right now. Besides, it would be hard to explain otherwise, as he could not talk and... Well... There's no sense of jumping to conclusions. He would just merely return it some other time when no one was looking. Soon the soup was ready and the table was set. Leclo scooped up the bowl into his hands, ready to eat. Not yet, Nobetha scolded him. Leclo paused. He could feel the warm steam teasing his nostrils. Put the bowl down, and bow your head, and close your eyes, she instructed, waiting patiently for him to do so. Leclove tilted his head, reluctantly set the bowl down, and shut his eyes. Satisfied, Nubetha took a deep breath before beginning. Great Spirit, thank you for the food and the life that you have given us. Bless us that we may bless others. Thankfully, the prayer was short. You may eat now, she said at last. Leclove did exactly that. He discarded the spoon completely and took the bowl up in both hands and began wolfing down the, the steaming hot vegetable soup. Nobetha watched in amazement and made a mental note that she would need to go to the market to get more food soon. Unable to talk, the conversation was relatively one-sided. Nobetha bragged about her different recipes. The only thing she got out of the blind mute were inaudible grunts, followed by the occasional clatter of an empty bowl, which Nobetha quickly refilled. She didn't mind it at all. She hadn't had company in a very long time, and she was happy to have someone to talk to, besides the goats. Leclove became very fond of the old woman. He had never known anyone so patient, hospitable, or kind as in, in his entire life. Every day they ate the same thing, vegetable soup, goat's milk, goat's cheese, and bread. She said the same prayer. Great Spirit, thank you for the food and the life you have given us. Bless us that we may bless others. The first time he heard the prayer, Leclove didn't pay much attention to it, but the second and third time it lingered in his heart, and he contemplated every word. He found a strange delight in his blindness, 
the curse that had undoubtedly m been meant to bring him to his ruin. Yes, he was blind, but he had never known so much peace in his entire life. Never before had he been so still or silent. Strangely enough, he thought he saw more this way, or rather felt more than saw. Leclerc was surprised at how much more aware he had become and how quickly he could get around in the past few days. Sure, he had his occasional blunders, but it wasn't as near as bad as the first day, or the second, or the third. However, today was a different day. Uh, today, Nobatha had decided that they would go to town to sell the, the tea leaves that she had grown in her garden. The clove helped carry the large sacks of tea to the small wooden cart that was pulled by Nobetha's mule. Flash. Flash was his name. For the life of him, the clove never understood why she named him this. The mule was so slow, the clove was certain that he could have pulled the cart faster himself. Seeing the young man's impatience, Nobetha laughed. I am old. We will get there soon enough. She assured him. Leclove let out a large, pent-up gust of air and forced himself to relax. He took in everything. It was a beautiful day. He could feel the sun on his skin, and there was a breeze that kept the insects away. The closer they got to town, he noticed how the animals then the birds grew quieter. He began to distinguish the sounds of bustling crowds in the distance, Soon they came to the market where the merchants set up their brightly colored booths. Once Nabetha found a spot at an open booth, Leclove began unloading the big sacks of tea leaves from the cart. Nabetha was surprised at how much help Leclove was. She wasn't as surprised as he used to be, and when it came to heavy lifting, he was all too eager to lend a hand. He got around surprisingly well for a blind man, though he did make the occasional blunder. Nobetha turned just in time to see just that. There was a shrill, frightened shriek. The clove nearly jumped out of his skin in terror as the stray cat jumped into the air, clawing at his face. Instinctively, he seized the tabby cat by the scruff of his neck and was about to hurl him out of the booth. But then Nobatha quickly stepped in to intervene. The clove, she gasped. She grabbed the cat out of his hand. I am so ashamed of you. The clove balled his hands into fists and let out a flustered gust of air from his nostrils. He shook his head while the mangy cat purred safely in Nobatha's arms. You scared him. Nobatha cooed as she set uh, the cat down with a small pan of milk safely out of the way. Nobetha looked back over to the clove and sighed, knowing that he needed something to help him get around better. She knew exactly what he needed. The clove was brooding over by the cart when he heard Nobetha approaching. Even though his clouded gray eyes couldn't see a thing, when he heard Nobetha approaching, he perked up a little and turned his head to look in her general direction. I think this may help you out, she said. He blinked inquisitively as she guided his hand to a long, smooth wooden shaft. It'll help you get around a little better, she assured him. What do you think? The glow felt the inscriptions on the hard wooden staff and grunted in gratitude. He was still a bit frustrated, not at Nobetha. No, she was always rescuing all sorts of stray and injured animals. But he was growing tired, tired of being blind. He was a warrior, not a blind beggar. Then again, he wasn't too sure about the whole blind warrior thing. His normal accomplishments throughout the day was either not banging his head or falling and tripping over himself. Not exactly great victories that would be written down by a bard, or for that matter, and even in daily conversation, not that he could speak. He really wasn't sure what was worse, being blind or mute. There were so many questions he wanted to ask. 
Yet he was limited to mere gestures, grunts, and gurgling sounds that made him feel rather simple and useless. Well, at least not as useless as the cat anyway. Just then, he paused. Something foul was in the wind. The loud chatter around him suddenly shifted to low murmurings. Nabatha gasped and put her frail hand onto his shoulder. Those poor souls, she breathed. The clove stiffened as he felt the tension in her withered hands. She was shaking. Nabatha turned her head. A light above. If I had the power to change this, she murmured sorrowfully. At that moment, the clove could hear the rattle of chains. And then he felt a new emotion come from Nabatha. Anger. Let those children go, she cried, her voice ringing out from the middle of the street. Leclos' hands tightened around the staff. He had never heard Nobetha raise her voice, never heard her angry like this before. Something was wrong. His hand had glided across the wooden planks, searching for a way out of the booth. Nobetha continued to plead, but the cold-hearted slave driver would not be swayed. Get out of my way, old hag, he snarled. Leclove gasped as he heard Nobetha's frail body hit the ground. The bustling masses didn't so much as murmur or stop to help. Even though he could not see Nobetha, he could still hear her. He could pick and point her breathing, her ragged sighs and sobs out of the crowd. Leclove pushed and shoved his way through the passing by townspeople. He crawled on hands and knees until he reached Nabetha, who was curled up on the ground. He gently placed his hand on her shoulder and could feel her entire body shake as she silently wept. Leclove wished he could speak, wished he could give a word of comfort to the poor woman, but the curse would not let him. He slowly managed to help Nabetha to her feet. No one stopped. No one said a word except the guards bringing up the rear of the slave train. They had seen what had happened and laughed in jest. Oh, save the children! Save the children! They jeered cruelly. The clothes spun around, whirling his staff. A loud, sickening, dismal crack echoed throughout the market. And then everything stopped. Le Clove, you... Nabetha stammered as she stared at the blind barbarian staring over the bloody body of the slave driver and then at the broken staff in his hand. You killed him, she gasped. Oh, this is M.R.R. Lopez, and you are listening to The Dragon Scourge. Stay tuned for Part 4.